they are among the most powerful forces on Earth, with swirling winds of more than 300 miles per hour and the strength to destroy nearly everything in their path. They account for 60 deaths and millions of dollars in property damage each year. They're called whirlwinds, funnels, twisters. These are tornadoes. You can feel the ground shaking. It feels like a continuous, small earthquake. And suddenly, I realized that everything around me began to just suddenly started to lift. And I had debris hitting the car, and things were lifting and lifting and lifting. It's coming right at us. And I'm not going to see my wife. I'm not going to see my daughter again. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to, I'm going to lose my life out here. From the British Isles to the French countryside to the heartland of the United States, tornadoes have been tearing up the landscape decimating buildings, homes, and entire communities. Now, there is growing concern that the number of twisters and the regions they encompass may be changing due largely in part to the effects of global warming. Fortunately, advances in science and technology are also on the rise, giving government agencies and broadcasters increasingly more time to warn the public of impending disaster. Will new science and weather forecasting help mitigate this increasing threat? They can occur wherever cold, dry air hits moist, warm air high in the atmosphere. Tornadoes have touched down in every continent except Antarctica, appearing where you least expect them. There are a few dozen cases a year in France, and roughly speaking, almost 95% of tornadoes in France are of low intensity, with winds estimated at less than 200 kilometers per hour. Violent tornadoes, even if they are exceptional, can occur in France. There is no construction that is completely safe from these phenomena. But of all the tornadoes on planet Earth, most are happening in a region of the United States known as Tornado Alley, where an estimated 75% of the world's tornadoes take place. An average of more than 1,000 twisters every year, four times more than in all of Europe. The central part of the United States is really the perfect laboratory to create the storms that make tornadoes. We have lots of warm, moist air that comes up from the Gulf of Mexico, and lots of cold, dry air that comes over from the Rocky Mountains. And those are the ingredients that allow us to get thunderstorms, that warm, moist air underneath that cold, dry air. But we also have the winds changing direction with height coming from out of the south at low levels and out of the west from over the mountains. And that produces the kind of storms that actually rotate that are much more likely to make a thunderstorms that'll produce tornadoes. And it's really the only place on the planet where that happens a lot of the time. The tornadoes get their energy from thunderstorms, and thunderstorms get their energy from the warming that occurs during the day, a bit like a hot air balloon. It rises because it is warmer than the air around it, and therefore thunderstorms will form precisely when we have air close to the ground, which is really heated, which will rise, and as long as it is warmer than the air around it, it will continue to rise. So it will form the cloud, and then the cloud, which will be able to extend to the top of the troposphere, at more than 10, 12, sometimes even 14 kilometers of altitude. And so, as the day goes on, the energy is stored near the ground. This is where thunderstorms will mainly occur. All the violent phenomena associated with thunderstorms, such as tornadoes, gusts of wind, heavy hail, or heavy rain. Central Oklahoma is a fertile breeding ground that produces more tornadoes per square mile than anywhere else on Earth. It is a place husband and wife storm trackers Val and Amy Custer call home. They live in the city of Stillwater with their six kids. 
to be willing to switch gears from being a mom and a homeschool teacher to a storm tracker in the field. Usually we start our day off looking at computer models, especially when we've been looking ahead for a week or so out and we see trends that might lead us to believe there could be a potential storm chase day coming up. Growing up, uh, I really liked weather. As, as I got older, that grew and eventually it, it led to having a passion to chase storms and having a passion to warn people and try to keep people safe. I really think I got the bug for storm chasing when I was a child growing up in southwest Oklahoma. There is just wide open plains there and it's just so fantastic because you would see the storms come in from the Texas Panhandle and to me it was always very exciting. Landing an internship at KWTV Channel 9 in Oklahoma City, Amy met Val Castor. We started a really great friendship, and so much so that he wanted me to chase storms with him. One day, we were chasing storms in the Texas Panhandle, and we were coming back into Oklahoma, and he pulled off on the side of the road and jumped out of the truck, and he asked me to marry him. I wished it could have been in front of a tornado. That would have been so awesome, right? Proposing in front of a tornado, but then we would have had to have somebody on camera to get it. Early this morning over in Norman, Oklahoma, meteorologist and storm researcher Eric Rasmussen begins his workday. First thing we do really is to, is to turn on the computer and start looking at the weather data. Uh, before breakfast even, we look at all the satellite images and we look at all the computer model outputs and try to get a sense of, of what the target region might be. Eric and his colleagues work at the National Severe Storm Laboratory and the National Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma, part of the United States government's National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. The folks in the Storm Prediction Center are, are continually monitoring uh, the weather from all across the, the United States, including the, the radars, the computer guidance, all the surface observations. So they're, they're keenly focused on how those conditions are evolving and, and whether or not it, it will be necessary to issue a severe thunderstorm or tornado watch, uh, which they would then send out to the appropriate forecast offices and to the media. After decades of being dismissed by more mainstream weather data collecting sources, Storm trackers like Val and Amy have become an integral part of tornado warning operations of the National Weather Service. As storm chasers, our primary role is to warn the public about severe weather. And when we go out, you know, we always take a moment and we pray for the people of Oklahoma because what we do in the field is very important. Val and Amy are assisted in their hunt for tornadoes by the high-tech equipment in their mobile truck, including a rooftop camera controlled by a joystick. I have the ability to turn the camera 360 degrees, and why that is so important is because when a storm is back behind the truck and we're having to adjust our road options and, and go with with the flow of the storm. Sometimes we're having to drive away from it, sometimes we're driving toward it. We also have a computer that's mounted there with a GPS readout on it. In the truck, we also have Wi-Fi, and Wi-Fi allows us to see the radar and see it in real time. Sometimes, I mean, that is a lifesaver as far as we're concerned. We also use a computer where I do a lot of video editing, exactly. and that video gets sent back to News 9 to be used on the air. We work closely with David Payne, chief meteorologist at News 9, and he will um, just collaborate with us and we'll talk about um, where he wants us placed, where we might need other chasers placed. The goal is to always try to be in the best spot with the strongest storm. David Payne is the chief meteorologist at Channel 9 KWTV in Oklahoma City. The station has long been considered a pioneer in severe weather coverage. I was born and raised uh, here in Oklahoma. Whenever there was any chance of storms or any severe weather growing up, I mean, I was 
I was so glued to the TV set, and I just wanted to see what was going on, and always has been such a big part of my, of my DNA. The one thing about Oklahoma weather is how violent our weather can become. We have more tornadoes per square mile than uh, any other place on the planet. Every day, the daily task is to give people the most accurate, the best information on where the life-threatening weather is, where these tornadoes are. Most mornings, uh, me and David will talk. I'll get his opinion about where he thinks things are gonna happen. I really think Northwest Oklahoma is where it's at. David said, yep, I completely agree with that. We'll look at all the different weather parameters and we'll pick out that tornado target together. I want Val to be in that spot. Using computer models and live radar, Val and Amy head out towards a severe storm system that is forming in rural Oklahoma. Damaging winds, large hail and tornadoes are predicted for the area. While most people under these circumstances would be heading away from the danger, these adventurers drive directly towards it. While en route, they will communicate their observations and feed live video to a local office of the National Weather Service, reaching the Storm Prediction Center in Norman. The Storm Prediction Center is often the nation's first line of defense against severe weather. Here, forecasters monitor weather conditions across the U.S. and relay forecasts of severe weather up to eight days in advance. They search the skies for specific rotating thunderstorms where most tornadoes are born. The king of all storm clouds, known as supercells. It begins when warm, moist air blows under cooler air. These strong winds collide, start to spin, and create supercells. For a supercell to produce a tornado, its horizontal wind motion must go vertical, where a funnel extends from the clouds to the ground. Yet few supercells actually produce tornadoes. I think the holy grail is to figure out how tornadoes form in supercell storms. We've known for a long time that the rotation is going on a few thousand feet above the ground, but we haven't been able to make that connection between the rotation aloft and the tornado at the surface. So just about everything we're focusing on right now has to do with how that creates the tornado. It's very complicated to have a tornado form because, in fact, in the supercell, you have to have a balance between the updraft that comes to feed the supercell and this downdraft from the other side. And why not all supercells cause tornadoes? The main driver in that thunderstorm is the updraft, okay? So the very first thing we do is we look for the updraft as it's going up. Typically, it might be, I don't know, anywhere between 1,000 and 2,000 feet above the surface, let's say, but that's what we call the updraft base. That's where all the action happens. We locate what we think is the strongest thunderstorm updraft, the one that's going to eventually take over and become dominant. And we find that, and we do our best to get under it. They're not just in one spot. They're moving at forward speeds of, you know, 20 to 50 miles an hour. We get under it. We stay with it. We're watching it close for signs of rotation. On this particular morning, the forecast calls for the high probability that a series of dangerous twisters will be forming in the region of Oklahoma, where storm trackers Val and Amy are headed. Forecasters at the Storm Prediction Center discuss conditions with local weather offices and issue a watch, notifying people in the affected area to stay alert for changing weather conditions and probable warnings. So the tornado watch is issued quite a few hours in advance of the expected tornadoes. The idea is there is that there's quite a few people that need to know that there may be tornadoes later that day. You're talking about emergency managers that have to get equipment put into place, like a, a rescue people, hospitals that may need to make preparations for uh, moving patients. And even the weather service offices need to know that the experts think there may be tornadoes so they can pay more attention to the conditions in their local area. 
As storm trackers Val and Amy Castor advance, the clouds darken, the winds begin to howl, the sky opens up, and baseball-sized hail begins to rain down upon them. Undaunted, the pair pushes forward. When Amy looks around through the truck's rotating camera, she locks onto a site they've been waiting for. It's a massive, swirling, cone-shaped tornado descending from the heavens and heading towards a small town directly in its path. Out in the field, Val and Amy Castor catch the first images of a tornado bearing down on a small town in Oklahoma. Val immediately contacts meteorologist David Payne back at Channel 9 Studios. I'll start yelling, tornado on the ground, tornado on the ground. And they know that they're going to have to do a cut in really, really quick. This tornado is a half a mile north of Highway 33. It is moving straight east. It looks like it, it might be 200 yards wide at the ground. It's moving towards the town of Kingfisher. Using GPS, the storm chasers take off in pursuit. When we first see that tornado touch down, I get pretty excited. There is so much going on at that moment that it can seem a little overwhelming. I'm looking at the camera. The shot needs to look great. The roads that we're navigating need to be checked out. We need to make sure that there's no bridges out. Sometimes I just have to look away from the camera lens and look at it, you know, just uh, through the windshield and just kind of take it all in because Really, the camera just does not do it justice. They send a live feed of the threatening twister to Channel 9 as David Payne is on the air. Look at that debris cloud. Yeah. Man, David, yeah. this thing got big and strong fast. Yeah. This Large. is not a weak tornado, David. No. And there you go. The meteorologists in the weather center are talking back and forth to me, telling me this is what's going on with this tracker, this is what's going on with the chopper. So many moving parts. And I've often called it controlled chaos because you have to stay ahead of what's happening. And my job um, is to give people at home the quickest and earliest warning that I can. Outside the studio is the station's own unique dual polarization Doppler weather radar. David assesses the information provided by the radar as well as data from a model-based computer forecasting system known as MAX. Gosh, when I first started back in the day, I mean, you would look at a piece of paper that came out in the morning and the evening, and it would tell you whether there might be possibly a, a storm or a, a higher relative humidity. I mean, that was it. And now the modeling is getting to where now we can take radar data, it's instantly ingested into the model, and it will give you where that storm is going to be in the next 5, 10, 15, 20, and 30 minutes. We need the data to be instantaneous. So the radar is always live. There's no delay for us. You're able to give the viewer at home, through the use of your storm trackers, your chopper, and your radar, the exact location of that tornado. We will make that call on. And I know that when I say, hey, this is going to be a News 9 tornado warning. The local branch of the National Weather Service also issues a tornado warning to the community. A twister is imminent. Time is essential. Today, the, for a tornado um, event, the average lead time is about 13 to 18 minutes. What our warning system is designed to do today is to offer people the opportunity to shelter in place. And unfortunately, there isn't a lot of time to do much more than that. 
But what if it were possible to give people more time to make those individual choices, to stay and shelter in place or evacuate? So it might be the case that a lot of people actually would prefer to get out of harm's way if it was possible to do so before a tornado strikes an area. If they were to do something like that, then they would need a lot more than 13 to 15 minutes to get out of the way safely. It would be really helpful if those individuals who would want to make those choices had information that targeted the time scale when they need to actually be making those decisions. Weather values have no intrinsic value by themselves. They acquire value by being used by people to make decisions. How do people make the right decisions that ultimately leads to the saving of life and less damage to property? Those are the kinds of questions being addressed at the National Severe Storms Laboratory, the research and development arm of the National Weather Service. When the Weather Service issues a tornado warning for a very large area, everyone within that area gets the same message. It's possible to get a severe thunderstorm or tornado warning while standing under clear skies. With less of an incentive for people to take any action, complacency can be the enemy when the next tornado strikes. We can produce the best forecast possible, but if people don't take appropriate action, then it doesn't matter. So that's why we have to do things like social science research to make sure that the information that we give them is actionable so we can save lives and property. Cody Berry, a research scientist at the National Severe Storms Lab, is leading a program to address the next generation of severe weather warnings, forecasting a continuum of environmental threats, or facets, seeks to fine-tune exact storm threats to specific areas. But facets is more than just the measure of science. It's also a study into human behavior. Research at the National Severe Storms Laboratory has asked forecasters what goes into making a warning decision and have found that there actually is a social component to making that decision, that they are considering what is going on in society as they make that decision. In order for facets to be successful, we have to integrate social and behavioral sciences with the physical sciences in order to create actionable information for our end users. Those are the kinds of questions being addressed at the National Severe Storms Laboratory, one of the research and development facilities of NOAA. The grids are actively moving in real time and assessing threats down to the exact streets. It's a very personal forecast telling you exactly what the threat is at your location. One of our areas of research is threats in motion, which is essentially taking the warning polygon that we currently have and moving it with the storm instead of it being stationary. So what that does is it gives people that are upstream of the warning polygon more advanced notice that a storm is coming if they aren't being weather aware. That when you're in the warning, you need to take action. Those that are outside the warning that are at increasing chances of being hit by a tornado, they can take their action at a lower threshold. What I envision for future tornado warnings is that once the National Weather Service forecaster issues that warning, it gets disseminated through a variety of methods. And that would include things like wireless emergency alerts on cell phones. That would include broadcast meteorologists on television communicating the current status of the weather situation and the warning. And it would also include third-party apps through private sector companies that can tailor those warnings to their individual users. As technology develops, people and places at high tornado risk around the world will have the ability to receive targeted warnings sooner and more efficiently to help make their own decisions. In France, we do not have a system such as those designed in the United States. So we're going to have the monitoring map that has existed since autumn 2001, which will warn about various severe weather phenomena. In France, there are generally between 20 and 50 cases of tornadoes each year. And these times are rather situated in the hot season, rather from May to October. 
and therefore the regions in France, which will be mainly concerned by tornadoes, will be located on the northwestern quarter of the country, but also close to the Mediterranean regions. On the night of August 3rd, 2008, thunderstorm cells are developing, and very quickly, these storm cells get stronger. They take on a rather peculiar shape and look just like supercells. So, at that time, it must be admitted that people were not necessarily aware of the risk of tornadoes and of these supercells. Shortly after 10 p.m., there was a tornado. And this tornado has reached an extremely strong intensity since it was estimated at EF4, with wind gusts that must have approached 300 kilometers per hour. Unfortunately, this tornado passed over an urbanized area, and so, inevitably, there were dramatic consequences. There are other regions in the world where tornadoes can be a significant problem, and they really haven't been studied enough for us to understand you know, how, how major the problem is. But for example, places like Bangladesh appear to have some pretty strong and large and violent tornadoes, a kind of similar or sometimes maybe even worse than what we, we tend to see in the central US. So the North Indian subcontinent especially the eastern part of it, is peculiarly prone to tornadoes. Uh, in fact, outside of the United States, this is the region that sees the most severe tornadoes, especially during uh, April to June period. Uh, the primary reason is that we have a dry line between the dry westerlies with the moist southeasterlies from the Bay of Bengal. And in the upper levels, generally during this season, there is the westerly, subtropical westerly jet stream that comes over this region. Along with that, there is a very cold air advection in the upper level. Very potent conditions for severe thunderstorms, especially tornadoes. Because of this, some of the most severe tornadoes of the country and of the world happen over this region. Bangladesh, for example, is a place that gets tornadic thunderstorms. They may not get as many storms as we get in the United States, but when they happen, they can be exceptionally violent. In fact, the, the single deadliest tornado we know of in world history took place in Bangladesh in the late 1980s. On April 26, 1989, the Manikganj district of Bangladesh was struck by an F5 twister the strongest tornado on the Fujita scale. The most severe tornado recorded in recent years was the tornado of uh, Manikganj uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, in that tornado, around 1,300 people died, and uh, more than 150,000 people were displaced. It was the deadliest tornado ever recorded in the world. Several reasons account for the extremely high death toll. The reason was mainly that over these regions, uh, the houses are mostly uh, with corrugated roofs and uh, fly temporary structures are more common. So in case of a tornado, these temporary structures are blown off and they become projectiles. So these cause more damages than expected. Problems that are there, there are epidemics, there are injuries, because of which also a lot of death and damages happen. There has been a lot of uh, improvement both in India as well as the neighboring countries. One of the most significant improvements was the formation of the Sark Storm Project, under which a lot of data was exchanged or is still being exchanged between countries which have, uh, neighboring countries which have a similar kind of problem during the period March to June. 
So during that period, uh, the observations are shared amongst countries. If we expect people to take action, the action has to be communicated to them in time for them to act upon it. So three hourly nowcasts for thunderstorms, their severity, likely impact is communicated in India up to the district level and block level, which is uh, as, as close as possible to the people, to the disaster managers, so that action can be taken and damages can be averted. With all these actions, we are seeing significant improvements, increasing awareness amongst the people. Back in Oklahoma, while David Payne tracks the moving storm, Val and Amy are chasing the twister that's about to strike the town. They like to get in close. And there are times where I'll be on the air, you know, and I'll, I'll kind of sweat a little bit and think, man, he is, he is right there. He's in harm's way, but he's good. And he knows how to get out of the way. I want to try and get us as close as possible to that tornado and still stay safe, all right? So close, but safe. I'm always about 10 miles ahead, looking at the map, deciding where to go. In 2013, the El Reno tornado struck central Oklahoma with wind speeds of 165 miles per hour. Val and Amy were there. We start getting hail, and the hail starts off as golf ball size, and then goes up to softball size hail. Just bam, 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 hail just falling all over the place, can't see much. And then all of a sudden, boom, we pop out of the rain in the hail core, and there's this massive multiple vortex tornado on the ground to our east. I mean, several, like three sub vortices just spinning around, kicking up dirt, and I'm looking at it, the largest tornado ever recorded. It's getting bigger and expanding over top of us. So we're backing up. Other storm chasers are turning around and leaving. We're getting winds flowing from the west to the east that's shaking our truck, kind of making us feel like we're floating on air, and that wind was flowing into it. That was a dangerous situation. Our pastor, Pastor Hardy at our church, uh, sent this text, and obviously he was watching Channel 9 coverage, and the text went like this. Um, Channel 9 has plenty of storm chasers, but your kids only have one mommy and daddy. And then the second part of that text was, listen to your pastor. Sudden changes in direction and rapid enlargement caught many off guard. Three veteran storm trackers were killed. Our job is extremely dangerous, um, but we have to be smart and use our experience and be wise about every decision we make because we do want to make it home safe to our kids. Many Oklahomans are descendants of generations that have grown up under the threat of tornadoes. For Val and Amy Castor, storm tracking is more than just a job. It's personal. And so we were watching that storm that formed out west of Stillwater, and that thing quickly got strong. Obviously, you know, our house is in Stillwater, and I called the babysitter, and I said, okay, I want you guys to get in the cellar right now. So she got all the kids, they went out to the cellar. As a mother, it was just horrifying. For the scientists who study them, getting too close to tornadoes has always been a risky business. Thunderstorms that produce tornadoes, this is an exceptionally dangerous place to try to collect data. Just above the ground, and in, with air coming down, potentially large hail in the area. It's just a very dangerous place to be. And so this has been one of our big limitations for a long time. Prior to the tornadoes forming, there's a rotating column of air that extends all the way to the ground. But 
Somehow the storm is concentrating that into a very small column, which becomes the tornado. And it's probably the mechanism is the same as a figure skater bringing in their arms and, and bringing that angular uh, rotation, that momentum inward, and causing it to spin more and more quickly. Just north of that ro rotating updraft in the supercell is where all the action seems to be in terms of developing the tornado. We've never operated there before because basically there's often baseballs falling from the sky and, and because we didn't know there was anything interesting going on there. Computer models are only as good as the data that's put into them. So in the spring of 2019, the National Severe Storms Laboratory and several partners launched Taurus, targeted observations using radar and unmanned aircraft in supercells. Meteorologist Eric Rasmussen, one of the foremost tornado researchers in the country, is the NSSL's principal investigator for the project. So Taurus has taken this approach where we're going to observe the, the supercell uh, and the area right around where the tornado forms a lot better than we have in the past. If we understand those processes are going on, uh, say, within uh, one to 10 miles from the tornado, we can probably infer how they contributed to the development of the tornado itself. The Taurus project is a uniquely scientific undertaking covering approximately 367,000 square miles from Texas to South Dakota. So what we're bringing together in Taurus is uh, some new combinations of instruments for the NOAA Hurricane Hunter aircraft with its airborne Dopplers uh, looking at the storm as they fly back and forth all day long. And another thing we're bringing in here is UAV aircraft that fly back and forth adjacent to the, the storm's rotation. Mobile mesonets, uh, these are big hardened vehicles like trucks with weather instruments on top. We can actually put multiple weather balloons in the air at once. And so that gives you kind of a swarm of observations around the low level circulation and give us a whole bunch of really crucial observations, of temperature, pressure, and humidity where we've never had them before. Those are new things that probably are gonna give us pretty strong clues as to how the tornado is forming within the supercell. NOAA is contributing its P-3 Hurricane Hunter aircraft to the project. As scientists fly close to the storms, they deploy global positioning systems, or drop wind sons. They scan them with weather radars on board, giving them a detailed look at the structure of the storms and their intensity. We're looking very close to where the tornado forms and trying to find out exactly how that happens and how the rotation on the horizontal axis gets turned into a tornado. We think it comes from a little pocket of, of intense rain or hail that forms miles away from that developing tornado and gives rise to this sort of motion. What makes a storm capable of producing those pockets of precipitation? What's the wind shear? How does the wind change with height in the atmosphere? If we can understand how those three steps hook together, now we have much better tornado forecasts out to maybe 30 or 40 minutes. Back on the road, still in pursuit, Val and Amy watch as the tornado rips through the neighborhood where they live, destroying houses and worrying that their own home may be next. And so this tornado is maybe a little less than two miles northwest of our house before it dissipated. And there's our house in the foreground. This tornado is behind our house. And the, my kids saw it. They took a picture of it. While the caster's home is spared, others living in the town directly ahead may not be so lucky. The tornado Val and Amy had been chasing has passed completely through the town.
They drive into the community to assess the damage. The widespread destruction is everywhere. We had the opportunity to go out into the neighborhoods that were hit the hardest with the F5 force winds and do a damage survey and talk to some of the residents. Just to see the destruction, the aftermath is very difficult for us to watch because, um, you know, lives are affected in ways that we don't even fathom. And the emotion that I felt was just overwhelming. The twister has cut a swath of destruction that extends for several miles. While the devastation is vast, the human toll from tornadoes can often be higher in more rural than urban communities. The rural communities tend not to have the same kind of communication infrastructure. If you think about how television covers storms and how large networks of people can come together to produce warning systems, that's a lot easier in a big city than it is in a rural community. Rural communities have to rely on, at times, less information to make a good decision to save themselves. And that is particularly true in the rural southeast of the United States. Here in Lee County, Alabama, in 2019, the outcome of an EF4 tornado with 170 mile per hour winds killed 23 people. For this, uh, F4 tornado is going to be about 70 miles as, as it went into Georgia. Uh, the power companies indicated that uh, approximately 116 homes were directly affected as, as far as uh, wet that cannot receive power. Um, and it would be somewhere within that number that were completely destroyed. It's just the emotions. Uh, you know, when you lose a grandson, it's very hard. We just try to put pieces back together and go on and just try and rebuild. Kim Kluckow McLean, lead researcher of the Behavioral Insights Unit at the National Severe Storms Lab, wants to understand how these rural areas become so deadly. The primary focus of my work is on the human behavior aspect where people and severe weather meet. And I try to understand how people understand the threats that could be posed by severe weather the ways that they are able to respond, the resources they need to respond. Kim travels to ground zero of the tornado's destructive aftermath, where she meets with the survivors, emergency managers, and meteorologists. But her first stop is the local cemetery. There had been these wonderful memorials set up to each individual that had perished in the tornadoes. There had been children who died, and that really struck the community um, very, very hard. And members of, you know, multiple members of single families that had, had passed away. For me, it was really important to know something about the people that we'd lost and try to put myself there as I considered what was the forecast and warning process like for them? Were they able to prepare themselves how might new technologies have made a difference? And in a bigger sense, I was also studying the communication system. So I was interviewing broadcast meteorologists, emergency managers, and weather service forecasters. Within the National Severe Storms Laboratory is the Hazardous Weather Testbed, a facility where people who are developing technologies can come together with the people who might use them. We bring National Weather Service forecasters from across the country into the same room with research meteorologists and developers, and they try out new tools and technologies to figure out how well they work within the flow of a weather service forecaster. We have started some collaborations with entities abroad. The UK Met Service is represented, Germany, France, even Australia, and parts of Asia. Um, they can come in and work with us as we're developing new forecast technologies and techniques. On the social science side, we've started to collaborate on 
messaging strategies because different countries message risk to their populations in different ways. Different meteorological services have been set up in various countries that just have different approaches that they try. We draw a lot of inspiration from what is done by American researchers and forecasters to learn from them. In Europe, we have a laboratory that was set up about 15 years ago called the ESSL, European Severe Storms Laboratory. And this laboratory aims to try to join forces in Europe to try to improve the forecasting of thunderstorms and all the severe phenomena associated with thunderstorms. They are working closely with the American researchers at the NSSL, National Severe Storm Laboratory. And also with the best American researchers at universities. They are going to propose, for example, tools such as a European database that bring together all the severe phenomena. We are going to test new products and also compare our weather forecasting methods. A newly published study suggests the frequency of severe tornado outbreaks has risen since 1954. Could global warming play a role? If we look at the period um, from early 2011 to early 2012, we set the record for the most tornadoes in a 12-month period, immediately followed by a record for the fewest tornadoes in a 12-month period. We now have fewer days per year that produce at least one F1 tornado or stronger. But we have a lot more days that produce, have a lot of tornadoes, say 30 or more tornadoes. These things have taken place at a time when the global temperature has been increasing. When you look at the current database, which includes all tornado cases, effectively, we see a huge increase in the number of tornadoes over the past 10 to 15 years. It's found in Europe, but it's also found in the United States, and of course, in France. The fact that the climate is getting warmer, we want to say yes, it will warm up closer to the ground, therefore more thunderstorms, and therefore we have more risk of tornadoes. But simply what will happen, probably with climate change, is what we call the jet stream. If the jet stream is shifted slightly further north from its current position, we would indeed have less wind with altitude, we would have less energy to form violent thunderstorms. And if we have less energy to form violent thunderstorms, there is there is less chance that supercells will develop and therefore tornadoes. In the end, it is difficult to have a consensus on climate change and the increase in the number of tornadoes. But a warmer climate may mean bigger tornadoes, like the EF5 that struck the city of Joplin, Missouri in 2011. This monster storm reached an extraordinary width of 1.6 kilometers. The Joplin tornado killed 158 people and caused $2.8 billion in damage. Back in Oklahoma, storm trackers Val and Amy Custer stop and walk through the destroyed town. They learn more about who survived this particular disaster and who did not. We were walking down this one block, and I, I talked to somebody, and uh, the, the house was gone, OK? There was just a little bit left. Uh, the bathtub was there. And as the tornado was coming, right before the tornado hit, there was a family. There was a mother and a father and three smaller kids, right? So what they did is they put the kids in the bathtub, 
and then the mother got on top of the kids, and then the father got on the very top, and I believe they tried to pull something over top of them, like a comforter or something like that. But when the tornado hit, every one of them survived, just with just minimal injuries. I just attribute that, you know, to God. People die in tornadoes primarily in two different ways. One is the building collapses around them and lots of stuff falls on top of them. But the most common way is probably actually essentially getting hit by debris that's flying horizontally. So if you're inside of a home, you want to be in the lowest floor, in a small interior room, no windows. You want to get as low as you possibly can in that room. Put on a bicycle helmet. Protect your head from blunt force trauma. If you're in a mobile home, uh, you need to get out of it. Uh, those tend to not be very safe at all. It's time for Val and Amy to begin their journey home and reunite with their children. Storm chasing for us, it's more than a job, it's a calling. With all the new technology, there's always gonna be a need for a storm tracker because you, you gotta have eyes in the field. You gotta have ground truth. We're so humbled to be in a position where we can broadcast information to hundreds of thousands of people that watch and it makes a difference in people's life. We feel like it's a calling from God. If you can give any family a warning that something horrible or potentially could kill them is headed their way, sometimes their homes or their businesses are wiped out and they, they listened and, and they walk out of that, that's what matters. At the end of the day, that, that's the only thing that matters. Val and Amy Custer leave the site where the destructive tornado blew in from the sky. But they are content in the knowledge that they have contributed to getting the word out about this awesome force of nature and have saved lives. <laughs>